Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream. I'm very excited about this episode because we're going to do a deep dive into some ufology from a world-renowned expert, Dr. Stephen Greer. And this podcast has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and it's been listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. Please subscribe, like, leave a comment. We read them all and respond as we can. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to take a class, become a facilitator anywhere in the world, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. And I myself am a visibility expert. I teach folks how to write a highly engaging book, private coaching for book writing, as well as group sessions. And I also have a company that takes books to a guaranteed international bestseller. And finally, I teach spiritual entrepreneurs how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts so you can get massive results for your being and for your business because you came here to be a light right now. And I've got some free gifts for you so you can learn how to use media to become highly visible right now. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. <clears throat> Today, my guest is Dr. Stephen Greer, one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject of UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence and technologies, and initiating peaceful contact with interstellar civilizations. For over 30 years, Dr. Greer has provided briefings for senior government officials across the globe, conducted numerous media interviews, and delivered hundreds of lectures. He's also written five books and produced 14, excuse me, four feature film documentaries that have been seen by hundreds of millions of people. Dr. Greer's relentless efforts toward the disclosure of classified UFO, ET information have inspired millions of supporters around the world. To learn more, go to SeriousDisclosure.com, that's S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com, and his YouTube channel is Dr. Stephen Greer 55. And with that, I welcome Dr. Greer to Dare to Dream. So great to have you here. Thank you. It's good to see you. I really yeah. appreciate your time. Me as well. Um, this is the conversation as far as I'm concerned. And I think not only have I gotten woke, as I just shared with you about three years ago, but ever since then, this is my path. Uh, my show's changed everything. The conversation's changed. And what I do, um, I use your app. You know, I do a lot of things around this that are of interest to me. Why do you think now, why do you think so many of us are becoming awake to the truth of this information? Well, I think it's a long process, but I also think that the universe is aligning for our civilization to move out of the last, what I call large cycle or yuga, uh, about 450,000 years into a new one. And the new cycle we're entering is a uh, universal one, by the way. It's not just Earth, it's the entire cosmos, and it's about a 500,000 year cycle. So we're in sort of the, the cross currents of the one closing and the other one opening. And so I think everyone on this planet right now um, are here uh, to be part of the birthing, as it were, of a whole new time in human civilization. A big part of it is the fact that we're gonna become a cosmic civilization. Uh, but the foundation of that, which is how I first entered into this whole subject, is the understanding of cosmic consciousness and higher states of consciousness. Uh, even, from, even the technological issues we're dealing with, with the UFO subject, require a high degree of enlightenment for them to be used safely. Uh, as you know, all technologies that humans have created over the last couple thousand years have been bent to the purpose of war. And that's very dangerous. And so when you start dealing with interstellar technologies, with so-called trans-dimensional physics, the uh, prime operator here has to be higher consciousness that's peaceful. 
And otherwise, it'll just be another weapon system, which is what covert programs have done, frankly, and get into that. So I think that the real essence of it is that there is a pulse moving through the cosmos and through universal, the, the universal field of consciousness that is calling people to understand not only this issue properly, but where humanity and Earth's place is in the scheme of cosmic order and the cosmic uh, thrust change that's happening, because it is a big change here and elsewhere. So I think that's really sort of the, the, the big picture. Um, the more specifically, however, this subject has broken into the mainstream. It's all been in the mainstream media in the last few years after we did uh, those of you who have, you know, an internet connection can see this documentary called Unacknowledged, and it's had about 740 million people see it, and it's about the work we've done on these classified projects uh, that then led to a bunch of people coming out of the Pentagon that ended up on 60 Minutes and CNN and New York Times. So the, what we've been trying to do for about 30 years is to find the, the evidence and the sources to make the scientific case that these objects are real. Um, the part that isn't being reported in the media, unfortunately, is that many of the ones that people are seeing are classified uh, covert human aircraft. And the actual ET ones are often uh, ignored by the media. And this is a very interesting development in the last, that's, that's new in the last three or four years. I think the other thing that's being ignored is that everyone's obsessed with the machinery. And I, when I started this project in 1990 as a young doctor, uh, 32 years ago, I said, you know, we're all focused on this uh, machinery. I'm more interested in who's, who's inside. <laughs> it's a very simple perspective. But it's like, it, it, you know, if the President of the United States or the Dalai Lama is pulling up for a meeting, are you really obsessed with the car? Or are you interested in the person who's inside? It's just, it's a simple way of putting it. So, so really, I think we have to shift our focus, uh, uh, at least for this discussion today, on who are inside these, these craft, why are they here, how do we make contact, how do we establish a peaceful relationship instead of letting it devolve into the hands of warmongers and militarists. And that isn't going to happen at the White House and Congress and UN yet. That's going to happen by you and me and, and the enlightened awake people all over the planet. So that's why we started what you referred to the CE5 contact uh, initiative, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And the CE5 contact app, you can get at your app store, is actually a whole training program. So people can learn with the techniques that can be used so that each person can become a, sort of a, a liaison between humanity and these civilizations, which I think is so important. It's the ultimate citizen's diplomacy. Yeah, I, that's interesting because I've used your app. We have your app, our friends have your app and we've done several out in Joshua Tree experiences. Mm -hmm. And the yes. first time we did, um, it, it was a beautiful evening. I mean, whether mm -hmm. something happens or not, it's just spectacular, but it didn't, you know, there were a lot of false starts. And then around one or two in the morning, we were driving home. It's a long drive back to Los Angeles two people asleep in the back seat, my partner's driving, I'm in the front seat, staying awake, so he stays awake. And all of a sudden I looked up above the truck we were in and there was a craft sitting there, not moving, no propulsion, right. and right. I freaked. I'm like, pull over, right? Um, we couldn't pull over fast enough actually because there was enough traffic still. But strangely, when we did get over and get out our phones so we could take pictures, mm -hmm. nobody else saw it. My question to you, though, is because so many people were balking and saying, mm -hmm. oh, that was government this and that. It was, you know, putting it off to something mm -hmm. else. I know what it felt like, but how does somebody know when they see these things in the sky? How do they know that this is actually from another civilization or another planet or universe or parallel universe, or this is something that we stole here that is actually an alien technology? Yeah, I think very, very good question. Uh, it's, it's the heart of what we're gonna be focusing a lot on. We're doing a conference in Scottsdale, uh, April uh, 8th, 9th and 10th at 
people can attend virtually. It's sold out pretty much uh, at this point, uh, but people can be there and, and through webinar. And that's a really key point. But the ones that are actually interstellar, first of all, all their communication systems are not going through the speed of light like you and I are right now, electromagnetic. They're going through thought and consciousness interface technologies, what I call consciousness assisted technologies. And so they're interactive with thought and intent. And people need to remember that. The second is the man made ones don't do that and, and also have parts. So if there are seams and rivets, like you see on a Boeing 747, but it looks like a UFO and there are structural elements, that ain't interstellar. The interstellar ones are seamless. Often they're like a plasma or a light. They can be partially in or out of this dimension. Uh, and they have almost a light from them. Uh, and the feeling from them is, is very uh, rarefied. It's a very clear, uh, even if it's not clearly in this dimension, it's partially in this dimension, we can get into that. Um, it's kind of like a rheostat. You can dim and brighten a, a light bulb a light with a, where you turned a knob. These technologies that are interstellar allow them to be fully on 3D, only partially in this dimension and mm -hmm. appear like an orb or something. But they're very, very different from something that's being built by Lockheed Skunk Works or when the aerospace contractors. My uncle worked for Northrop Grumman and helped design the lunar module that put the first man on the moon. Um, that, that funny looking machine that landed the first time. It was my uncle worked on that. But I think that you know, there are very clear, distinctive, and the third big distinction. So there's the consciousness thought interface, there's how it appears, and then it's whether or not it's uh, got the feeling of being invasive. If mm. it's invasive and scary, it is always ours. That includes, this is why so many people who have been quote unquote abducted, we now have CIA documents and witnesses from inside intelligence operations where they've used the man-made UFOs to quote, abduct and scare people mm. for its psychological warfare value. Because ultimately these fascists and warmongers want an interplanetary war, right? So we're trying to stop that. But there's a very distinct energy since you do energy work that's kind of invasive. Whereas the actual ET ones are there, they're wanting you to acknowledge them. It's very back and forth, it's very gentle. Now, people may get startled when it comes on 3D, but they're not invasive where they're going to do anything um, like that. So there are certain, uh, what I call hard um, indicators like the structure and what have you, um, and others that are more energetic. And the biggest one is the consciousness thought interface. So I tell people, if you see something that um, you, you're questioning, think with clear, direct intent and ask it to do something mm -hmm. that, that a normal aircraft can't do. And you can be specific, come closer, go up, go right. And many, many times they will. And when that, ha or come, you know, do something else, you know, just say, do something really amazing. And we've had this happen where they come and they're sitting there and then they come in and make, one of them came in over Joshua Tree. I, I think it was when I was with Demi Lovato. And it came in and made uh, a symbol of a fish. And then that line it made in the sky stayed there for 45 minutes, even in a windstorm. Weird stuff, cool stuff. So there is this interactive component to it. And people say, oh, how weird. I said, well, it's not weird when you think you and I are communicating at the speed of light. But at the speed of light from the Andromeda galaxy, which is two and a half million light years from here, it would take two and a half million years for you to say, hi, how you doing? And another two and a half million years for someone there to say, I'm okay today. How are you? That's 5 million years at the speed that you and I are communicating. So all of their technologies are phasing through increasingly conscious dimensions and fields, but are also interfacing, not just psychically or, or telepathically, interfacing with very advanced technologies, electromagnetic subtle fields, transdimensional physics, we call it is beyond the scope of this discussion today, but uh, we're gonna go into that quite a bit over the weekend in Scottsdale, uh, April 8th, 9th, and 10th. But I think that's why the CE5 contact um, effort, there is sort of a learning curve, uh, you know, initially, but then once you figure out some of these markers and information, 
uh, it becomes clearer and clearer. The other thing that what you said is classic. People will be out there wanting to make contact. And often it, that sets up the conditions. And then when you're least expected, it, they, they picked up on it. Then they appear. Why? Part of it is that when you're actually doing it, a lot of people are tied up very much on, on trying to force it. It's like when you're trying to go into deep meditation or fall asleep. If you try too hard, it doesn't work. But when you set up the conditions and then that's then running almost subconsciously, then it, the event will happen. We, we've observed this for 30 years. Uh, the other part of it is that it may be that when you're actually doing it very intently with the techniques and we send out uh, electronic tones out through into space with these tones that we have, uh, that are in the app, by the way, the CE5 contact app, we, we find that often it'll be when you least expect it because it could be that if they did it right then, the military might intercept them and try to shoot them down. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, there, there are hundreds of um, impinging exigencies that are very hard to uh, calculate in the moment. But these civilizations are certainly calculating it, and, and I attempt to when I'm leading a team. And so I tell people that it's a very uh, nuanced and, and sort of a, a dance, cosmic dance between humans and these civilizations and setting the conditions up. Uh, the most important condition, by the way, is the purity of heart and what your intention is. They're not so much interested in people who are just curious to see them. They're more interested in people who are devoted pure, in a pure-hearted way to developing a positive, peaceful relationship between humanity and their peoples, not just one civilization, all of them, because that's the hallmark of the era we're moving into is universal peace, not world peace. World peace should have been 1918 after World War uh, I. It's too late for only world peace. We're going to have to transition quickly to world and interplanetary peace. And that has to happen fairly quickly. Yes. So I want, I want people to have an idea, juxtaposition here, because Dr. Greer, you've attended really high level meetings with hundreds of military, government insiders, whistleblowers, briefings with government officials. And plus, on the other hand, you are an Alpha Omega Alpha, the most prestigious medical honor society, and you're an emergency physician. I'm curious because I know you had humble beginnings. Did you yeah. ever envision on your life <laughs> journey that you would be here in this UFO universal related, having meetings with executives of the world? You know, some deep part of me probably did. Honestly, I did when I was maybe three, four, five years old, hmm. but didn't know quite how it would play out. And I grew up uh, very poor in the South in a shack uh, with, with two rooms, uh, no central heat, no air conditioning. Um, put myself through high school and college and medical school. And uh, I always joke, uh, uh, my African-American girlfriend in high school, we, we thought was so rich because her father delivered letters for the post office. And for our family, they were like, so wealthy. We were just amazed. That's how poor we were. Anyway, so, but I had some experiences when I was young that indicated when I was eight, I had a clear daytime. I had an ET craft come over the neighborhood I grew up in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And my twin sister and some friends saw it. Of course, my parents said, oh, those don't exist. You know, that was, you were hallucinating or you were making this up. But, you know, we saw, we know what we saw. And then after that, I started having some contact experiences, sort of in the dream state at night. And then when I was 17, I got very sick and died, had a near-death experience. And I was raised in a very devout atheist family. <laughs> they didn't believe in anything. Um, so when I had that happen, I had this experience of cosmic consciousness that was so beautiful. And it was unbelievably beautiful. And then I decided after that, I'm going to learn meditation. So on my 18th birthday, I learned how to meditate and then went off to college. Well, when I was up in the North Carolina mountains, you probably have seen this in the movie Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. It's up on Amazon and everywhere now. 
but what happened is that I went up there just to meditate at sunset up on this 5,000 foot mountains, mountain in the North Carolina uh, Blue Ridge. And just before sunset, the same spacecraft that I saw when I was eight or nine appeared and it materialized sun shining on it uh, over in the Southwest. And then it sort of dematerialized. And I said, oh, they're back. I didn't think anything more. And I went into this deep meditation and at the end of the meditation, it was so long. I opened my eyes and it was pitch dark with the Milky Way above me. I was up at over 5,000 feet, crystal clear weather in October of 1973, dating myself now. But, um, but I'm a young 18, I just turned 18. And I go into that state of samadhi and cosmic consciousness that I had when I died. And there was an ET craft and a be beings that were right there and came over and one of them touched me. And um, so I knew from when I was young, I was, had a connection to this, but I had no idea it would play out this way, in part because I don't know that the, the universe at that time had hoped this would be resolved uh, in terms of government and technology. And I, I kind of think those of us trying to do this now, we're just sort of the last stop on the F train because the world is getting F'd. Uh, and big time, because the technologies behind how these things move would tomorrow get us off all oil, gas, coal, nuclear, and end poverty in the world. And that is real. Those technologies exist. The world is 100 years behind where it should be. And that's why we have all these geopolitical problems, oil wars, uh, pollution, biosphere collapse, et cetera. It's all man-made and it all, it can be fixed by people. But I think that somehow that didn't get resolved because of corruption. And then in and when I started this project in 1990, two years later in 92, I was down in Florida and we were doing the CE5 uh, contact techniques on, on a beach near Pensacola. Uh, and suddenly four of these ET craft appeared. And it's that funny video, you can't see very well because it was a very bad quality camera. And there's this sort of Southern guy going, holy damn hot shit. You know, it's a very funny video, excuse my language. But, um, but it's really cool. And, but that ended up on the front page of the Pensacola paper the next morning because other people took a picture. It was this huge event. And then, then the entire intelligence community, head of army intelligence, CI, NSA people approached me because they knew we had discovered sort of the Rosetta Stone of making contact, because they knew this was real. I mean, I've been ridiculed a lot, even in the UFO circles, for using consciousness and meditative states and all this, but the intelligence community knew this back in the 50s, by the way. So they knew here's a group of civilians, not under their control, bypassing their control freak systems, and also their disinformation you know, where everyone, nobody would do this because they're terrified of the aliens. I'm going, no, you don't need to be afraid of the ETs. You need to be afraid of these fascists that are running these programs. And that really concerned them. So they came after me and came after me hard. But at the same time, the universe moved into place, people I call the white hats, the, the good people who were in the intelligence community and Pentagon who wanted to support what we were doing. And so a year later, I'm briefing, the director of the CIA for Bill Clinton. I mean, that, so that happened very quickly between 92 and 93. So that's how that unfolded. Clinton Library, you know, it shows that there's at least five folders, at least 45 pages about conversations, meetings that you had directly with President Clinton. Did anything good come of that? Any kind of change? No, because here's the big problem people need to understand. This is why we have to do a citizen's diplomacy effort with the ETs. Um, I was in meetings in the past week uh, in Washington with very senior people who are being blocked from getting any information on this from the intelligence yeah. uh, still. And, and Clinton, Clinton was completely pushed aside. Mm. So Lawrence Rockefeller hosted him at the Rockefeller Ranch, we put together the briefing materials. Uh, he was hosted after I spent about three hours briefing the director of the CIA for Bill Clinton. And 
um, it was very devastating because uh, when I learned, and I didn't believe it initially, I thought it was a very bad uh, John Le Carre novel or a uh, conspiracy theory, I didn't believe it, that the president and people like that and senior senators I had met with were being denied access to these projects, that they were deep black, beyond black. Uh, and that's why we named that movie Unacknowledged. It's the first word in Unacknowledged special access project, which are the ones that are being managed without uh, legal authority and oversight. That's very dangerous, uh, honestly, when you're dealing with this kind of knowledge and technology for a group of people who have fascist totalitarian tendencies to have this kind of knowledge, science, technology. But the president was not given barely any information. Um, and every president since him have been in a similar boat. Um, you, one or two of them have gotten some, but it's usually been false information designed to either shut them up or get them to do something like Trump did and that's support the Space Force and, and put weapons in space. So um, it's been very manipulative as opposed to honest. Uh, and then I at, I'm asked to come in and correct that. So at, towards the end of the Trump era, some of his close friends says, you've got to put together information for them because if he gets a second term, he didn't, um, this is going to go further. And I said, yeah, it's very dangerous. But uh, other presidents have been a bit tricked that way also. The same thing has happened in the Congress. You know, for years, I've met with senators and Congress people who have been on key committees, such as intelligence, uh, armed services, government oversight. All of them have been blocked and denied access. So I think that uh, I'm one of the few people who can speak with authority from being firsthand briefing these people that there really is something very, very wrong with governance and, and uh, control of these projects. It's not that there aren't black projects that are overseen by uh, the president and Congress, there are. There are unacknowledged projects overseen, but not this subject. This is, this is in a category unto itself. And because of that, they can't really, I'm asked all the time, why doesn't this president or this senator or this head of state or this prime minister in the United Kingdom disclose this? I said, I'll tell you what the CIA director told me, word for word. Very end of the meeting, I go, we really need you and the president to get fully in control of these projects and bring them out to the public so they could benefit the planet tremendously and also avoid conflict with these civilizations. And, and he turned to me, the CI director right in my face says, how do we disclose that which we have no access to? That is a devastating admission. Yeah. So, so this is the mess we're in. Mm -hmm. So a few years ago, I gave up my medical career to try to resolve that problem at the same time and bring those sciences and technologies out so we can save the biosphere. At the same time, I'm, we're trying with the CE5 contact effort to train millions of people around the world. And I appreciate your help getting this word out to know how to do this because when enough people unite in consciousness positively, and you know this from the studies and the science of consciousness, it can shift. It only takes 1% of the population doing something at a higher level of consciousness in a meditative state to move the other 99% of the people in a positive direction. So there's enormous power uh, if enough people do this together with, with a clear intention of why they're doing it. Um, it's got to be something beyond just curiosity and sort of a facile um, passing interest. It has to be something that's deeper, yeah. you know, which, which is really key. I, it's Heart interesting you said anybody would poke fun at it. You know, I think the protocol of the CE5 is brilliant. And one of the things I really like about it that I find like, duh, it's genius, is that we can speak in consciousness to who is out there and let them know where we are. And so you talked about the fact that you did this in one of your documentaries, you did this when you were younger, and then you've incorporated this into the protocol that you could literally create a, a world map, then a country map, a state map, and precisely where you're sitting to say, please come. Right. And 
you know, I'm geographically challenged. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing that that would be the one that I love the most, but I do because I can visualize yes. that and it makes mm -hmm. sense. Energy is everything. Yes. And remember that those visual thought forms are real. What is thought? What is a quanta, mm. a discrete thing of thought? Well, you know, if, if you were to show this iPhone I'm using to Thomas Jefferson, his house is right down the road here, um, a couple hundred years ago, it would be considered sorcery. It'd be mm. witchcraft. It'd be magic. So think about a civilizations that are hundreds of thousands, some of them millions of years more advanced than we are what their technologies look like and all of their communication technologies and even their ability to materialize and dematerialize are interfacing in this field consciousness and thought. And that's why I tell people the next huge science of the next thousand years is the science of consciousness. Mm. And it, it was useful for me, by the way, before I became a medical doctor, to become uh, a meditation teacher. So, you know, people like Louise Hay of Hay House was a student of mine and a lot of other people. And um, what I, I was 19, but I, I got and finished college and then went off to become a meditation teacher and then went around the world setting up meditation centers when I was 19, 20, 21. I was in Israel for three years doing stuff. So it was like very interesting. And, uh, but it was really good that I did that before I was a medical doctor, which is very rigorous left brain, mm -hmm. but I'd had these experiences in higher consciousness and Sanskrit and the Vedas, mm -hmm. uh, the Vedic teachings and the cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, which are the abilities and powers that you develop when you experience higher, deeper states of consciousness, uh, such as levitation, materialization, telekinesis, um, clairvoyance into the future, telepathy, all that. Those are all cities. And you learn about those and I practiced them. And I had a couple of levitation experiences when ex spontaneous ones, I wasn't trying to. But I think that becomes something that you begin to understand and, and that this really is the biggest part of the secret that the intelligence community doesn't want people to know. Because if everyone knew that the totality of the cosmos, and the, the, the cosmic consciousness is enfolded like a, a hologram, a conscious hologram in every single person, that every single awake person, human and ET, have the totality of all that there is folded within the structure of consciousness, their own consciousness. That's the deep aspect, the universal aspect. When people realize that, then the kind of power that people who are, are at that state of knowledge and experience, there's nothing that these intelligence communities can do to stop that. Mm. That's the power really, of that. Yeah, it's so interesting how history repeats itself and somehow mankind mm -hmm. does not learn because we're still living <laughs> in a time where there's these superpowers and these states, they're still jockeying for commodity and resource control. It's maddening to yes. watch play out. How does it impact or affect or influence any invitations or any issues making extraterrestrial contact with what's happening today? I think that, you know, there's always needs to be what is called situational awareness. Uh, it's a good term that the military uses of what's going on around you. But overall, I would say the ETs are always watching what's going on, like in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, they're very aware, don't forget, the big modern era when all these craft came in was when we detonated the first atomic bomb. Right. Roswell was not an accident that they were there. It was the only place on the planet in 1947 where atomic weapons were stored at that time. That's why they were there. Because when we detonate those, it not only creates huge damage on Earth that they're concerned about, it creates a... Uh, beyond the electromagnetic pulse that everyone's heard about that can take out all of our electricity and, and communications, it creates another wave that's called a scalar or longitudinal pulse that's faster than the speed of light that damages extraterrestrial worlds and communication and travel. So it's like it says, you know, forgive them. They know not what they do. When we did this, you know, Edward Teller and Einstein, Oppenheimer, none of them realized that it would have that effect because they didn't understand 
the trans-dimensional aspect of an atomic or an a thermonuclear later hydrogen bomb of detonation, but the ETs did. And that also indicated that we were a civilization that while we have a great deal of promise, if we stay on that path, it could extinguish life on earth, but we could become a threat to innocent planets out there. So I think that all of this has caused there to be, let's call it the cosmic order. And there is a cosmic order of these civilizations that work together. There are dozens, hundreds of them um, that we've been in touch with, very concerned about what happens when a society such as Earth has technologies that get way ahead of their spiritual and social development. And so it's, it's, it's not in balance. Yeah. So what we have to do, we have to balance social and spiritual development as we develop these extraordinary, wonderful technologies. Why? Because as I said earlier on in, in this interview, if, if that's not brought into balance, those amazing technologies get bent to the, the purpose of war and are, are taken over by people who profit from war, benefit from war, control the masses through fear and war. And that, that's something that is a huge problem. I suspect many civilizations have gone this way before us, but if we don't get it right, it's, it's an extinction level event that could happen. And, and the ETs are, are aware of that. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the message many of us have received since childhood is that we have to really change the way we're living on this planet. Even Colonel Corso, who wrote the book the day after Roswell, told us that before he died, that we had a meeting with an ET out at White Sands where we detonated the first atomic bomb. The ET said to him, you know, please stop doing these things. And of course, he said, what's in it for me? And the ET said, I, I end the documentary Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind this way, because it's such a beautiful story. The ET turns to this old colonel, Air Force colonel, and says, a new world if you can take it, a new world, a totally new world, beautiful. Powerful, yeah. I love what you said here, technology that we are using on this planet that's beyond our spiritual and social development. Right. That is a great sound bite. Because know- we have to bring it into balance. We have, to pull, we have to bring up our social and spiritual awareness and how we behave together mm. so that we can handle these technologies which could they can be used as weapons, but these so-called zero point and even anti-gravity technologies could transform the world into a paradise, literally. Perfect. But, but yeah, see, it's, 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 it's a double-edged sword though, if it's used for, uh, by lower consciousness for war and, and for social disruption or Machiavellian you know, manipulative you know, things like is normally the case with power hungry uh, sociopaths. Mm -hmm. which unfortunately are most leaders on the planet. Most people, yes, in charge. This is true. Yeah, in charge. That's why they're there. They like the power. You know, it's really interesting you bring that up, Dr. Greer, because I know you've been supervising this global search for alternative energy sources. You just mentioned Mm -hmm. them, zero point, also over unity devices. How is your plan going to identify, to develop these in order to eliminate the need for fossil fuels? That's been the hardest thing to do um, because no one in the corporate government world wants to do it. And so far, the civilian community interested in this subject has not had the resources to develop it independently. There are people who stumbled across this technology. They're usually confiscated. There are a lot of people out there who claim they have it that are frankly charlatans. Um, And we've tested them and it's just to be, it's fraud. Um, and then there are the ones who have them, but in order for them to move it forward, they want a hundred million dollars or 10 million, which we don't, I'm, you know, I'm a retired emergency doctor. I mean, we, I'm not a hedge fund manager or something. So I think part of it is the resources I'm, I'm thinking, of course, I don't have anyone who knows how to do this, but I'm thinking of launching a series of NFTs and maybe even a cryptocurrency that would be the revenue would be dedicated to opening a research and development lab to develop these and do it open source. What I mean open source is no intellectual property holdback. It's released in real time as soon as we have our discoveries for free on the internet. Anyone who can build a system like this could build it. There'd be no licensing, no intellectual property, 
no holdbacks, no patents, because that's the only way to get it out, because the patent office is going to confiscate it. I know people who've done that, and they get what's called an NSO, National Security Order, on it, and it's taken. So I think that there, we have a plan for doing it, but we've never had the resources to do it. You know, everything we do, like these documentaries, Unacknowledged, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, um, the new one that came out this summer, The Cosmic Hoax, those all are crowdfunded. And, you know, we can raise a few hundred thousand dollars to do that kind of thing. But you're talking 50 to 100 million dollars to open a research and development lab staffed up with physicists and engineers that know what they're doing safely and the information technology systems. So it's the whole lab is live streamed. My goal is that the entire process would be transparently on blockchain live stream. So there'd be no latency period, no downtime where it could disappear by a bunch of jackbooted thugs that come in and confiscate it. So I think that we have a plan for it, but it's not going to be done as inexpensively as putting on, you know, doing a, a feature film. Uh, and we've never had those resources. You know, maybe someone listening could do that. If we could get one venture capital fund to do it as an angel uh, effort there in uh, Silicon Valley uh, for a fraction of what they put into things that, you know, really don't matter, um, you know, the next internet app or something, it would be done. I think we'd probably have something about a year and a half. Um, because I have a CIA disc that has um, uh, hundreds of pages of confiscated patents that deal with this that were handed off to us. But, you know, I'm not an electrical or mechanical engineer. And, you know, I, most people, if you gave them a, a, a plan of how to build their toaster oven, couldn't do it. I couldn't. <laughs> so you have to have people who can do that and then get it out to the public. But um, that's a big problem. That's the the third leg of what we've worked on, we worked on disclosure, CE5, contact. This part of it's been the hardest thing to accomplish because it's also the most, um, in many ways, it, it, it's the ultimate disruptive technology. I mean, to be frank with you, I mean, imagine coming out with a, an operating system, a device that looks like your heat pump or smaller when you're at your house that would run everything for free. Well, goodbye public utilities. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, all the Fortune 100 corporations that are related to stocks and transportation, energy. Goodbye, oil. Goodbye, entire national economies that are oil dependent economies Russia, Venezuela, the Middle East, Saudi, Iran. They would have, they'd have to find another thing to do besides pumping junk out of the ground and destroying the biosphere. So it's an enormous undertaking. It should have been done 100 years ago. Tesla knew this stuff. But here we are. We have to deal with the hand we've been dealt. It's a difficult hand. But I think we, we can do it. it. But it is not going to be easy. Easy would have been between 1880s and 1920s. That's when it should have happened, looking historically. And we could have. You know, one of the, the, the next uh, one of the next big feature films I want to do is uh, I call it the lost century, where we have we have this huge archive of proof of all these sort of technologies and devices that existed 100 years ago and what happened to them, how they vanished. Um, and and to make the case for not just that they exist, but here's a plan to get them out and then at the end have a lot of really good. Um, motion graphics that show what the world looks like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. And you know, this is some a real concern. I, mean, I have four daughters and 11 grandkids. And, <laughs> and so you think, well, what are we leaving here? You know, this should have been fixed by, by the time I was born in 1955. I'm no spring chicken. So, uh, and here we are, you know, uh, two thirds of a century later, three quarters of a century after Roswell, still running on cars. And I hate to tell people with battery cars, I have one, I have two, but you're plugging that in to an electric grid that's fired 80% of it from oil, gas, and coal. It, it, it makes you feel good, but it's not a solution unless the underlying energy that's running the electric grid is clean. But solar and wind, I have the largest solar panel farm in Virginia, allowable by law. 
it won't even heat or cool this house mm. when our power goes out. And it's very expensive. So you, that's not going to be a solution in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And that's barely all the time we have left. So we're going to have to bring out these amazing new technologies that, that you referred to. It's past due 100 years. I couldn't, I can't help the fact that I couldn't have worked on it when I was, before I was born. But I think if enough of us come together um, in consciousness, but also in hard work, we could make that happen. But we have to understand the kind of headwinds that are blowing against us. There are a lot of special interests, let's call it, powerful interests, everything from the petrodollar to everyone who has oil, gas, coal, public utilities, nuclear power plants, all of that would go the way of horse and buggies. They'd be museum pieces. That's a big deal. Big deal. I got to say, you brought up something, and I hope I'm making a connection you might not have considered before, but when you brought up NFTs and crypto, you have a good friend who actually can help you with that by the oh, name yeah. of Billy Carson. Oh, okay. So yeah. mm -hmm. Billy is rather an expert in this area. I'll take 10%. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I would reach out mm -hmm. to him for mm -hmm. some assistance mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. with what you're talking about because he does webinars and stuff around this. Mm -hmm. So he's a great resource for you. Yeah, I need someone who can actually do it because I I, I I don't know how to program anything. In fact, I'm lucky I got on this Zoom call. I'm so stupid with things like this, but <laughs> I'm better with defibrillators. Anyway, but I, <laughs> that's but I what just, your I wife get, said. He doesn't like the camera in Zoom. I was like, but he's on camera all the time. I now know, I get I it. Know. Yeah, no, I, I'm 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 ten thumbs with any of this stuff, but uh, but I do think that that is one rev, uh, out way of doing it. The I mean, other, if anyone's, if anyone's listening, if anyone has such a system already built mm. and they need to find a way to get it out, if I had something already operational, let me make this plea. If I had something fully operational that we could vet, test, reproduce, no holdbacks, we could sign a non-disclosure agreement. There are people I know that if I could prove we have something like that, could make that person whole and, and so that they would release it for public use. Um, and, and I, at this point, have enough supporters and celebrity supporters that we could get that out to about a billion people very quickly, that, that knowledge that it exists. Um, so that's something we are looking for, but someone would need to cooperate with the disclosure of it. Many of these inventors, they want to, it's like my precious ring, you know, it's like what is it, <laughs> the Gollum or whatever. Um, uh, Lord of the Rings, they don't want the, they're afraid someone's going to steal their idea. Mm. And so what we need is to find somebody who understands that we're running out of time for those mm. intellectual property games. But there are now people in my network that could take care of those people financially so we could be clear to then open source it. Because I think the only way we're going to get it out quickly enough to save the biosphere and change the dynamic that we're in with the climate and also pollution, but also importantly, look what's going on in Ukraine. That's in a way an oil war. That's right. Russian oil, Germany, Western Europe's totally dependent on it. Um, you know, it, yeah, I put a, a two weeks ago, I put up on my YouTube channel about an hour and 10 minute to piece it's about great. I watched the Ukraine. Whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really important that people understand that these things are not unrelated to the ufo and the energy and technology issue they're very related these geopolitical conflicts because the reason we're in the jackpot we're in is that we have not brought out these things that have been wonderful sciences and technologies that would have made all that geopolitical dynamic based on oil obsolete decades ago and now the chickens are coming home to roost and we're on the verge of potentially world war three with nuclear weapons with russia this is very dangerous you know but it's avoidable. And, you know, as Einstein, Einstein said, no problem is ever served, uh, saved. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, no problem is ever solved by the level of consciousness that created it. Right. So the level of consciousness of greed and centralized power and money based on the oil and petrodollar can't, you can't redo that with these new technologies or what Silicon Valley does with a new iPhone or a new app or what have you, where everything has to be secret and monetized for, you know, you know, someone who has a billion dollars wants a hundred billion dollars. 
we're going to have to do this in a different way with a different consciousness. Um, and that's, we have to find people who understand that because the intelligence community is always 10 steps ahead of these inventors. They know exactly what they have at the moment it begins to emerge and go through a normal venture capital or patent, they're going to intercept it and they're going to neutralize it by any means necessary. So there, there, we have to develop a strategy and we have to work around their advantage. And the workaround is throw a huge light on it with a billion people who see it and a billion people who have the plans and you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube so hard and fast, they can't put it back in. That's what I did with the disclosure project. They couldn't do anything about it. So your upcoming conference in Arizona, mm -hmm. April 8th through 10th, it's mm -hmm. sold out. However, people well, can still attend. Little, yes, they can attend by webinar. Right, virtually mm -hmm. streaming, which sounds mm -hmm. awesome. So uh, I just want to let people know if they want to go the easiest way is go to the website, SiriusDisclosure.com. It's right there. As soon as you sign on, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com. I understand that every evening at your conference, it includes a puja ceremony. And yes. on the final evening, participants, even virtually, can join in this outdoor event under the stars. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yes, yeah, beautiful. So Friday night, the 8th, and Saturday night, the 9th, we'll be, we're, we can't be out on the native land those nights, so we're going to do it inside, but we're going to do uh, a Sanskrit puja meditation and an entire training for meditation and the CE5 contact protocols. And we'll have people there, about 600 people in the auditorium there, and then thousands of people online doing it simultaneously to create this mass consciousness effect. And then the last night on the Sunday, the 10th, we'll be out under the stars. We're gonna have a little stage out in the desert and we'll have about 500 people out there. It's all that site can hold uh, on this beautiful Native American land uh, east of Scottsdale out in the desert. And uh, they're, they've given us permission to do this uh, out there and it's beautiful. And I love that because my grandma was, uh, my dad's mother was Cherokee. I'm 5 16th Native American. So for me, it's really beautiful to do it on sacred native land. What is your daily ritual? Do you have a practice that you do? I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I'm curious anyway. What do you do every day to stay so calm and centered? What works for you? Um, a lot of things. I eat well. My wife's a great cook and takes mm -hmm. great care of us. Um, don't ask me to boil an egg. Um, I, I work out a lot, about uh, six to 10 hours a week. Uh, at the gym and also mountain biking, hiking. And um, I meditate every day. And, and even before dinner, I always take half an hour, 45 minutes to meditate. I do meditations and go into deep meditative states before bed and, and do lucid dreaming. And so I have this balance between physical activity and my work and staying in the meditative state and then I take these, do these retreats where we go away. Like after this three-day event, there's about 35 of us going out into the wilderness for a week uh, and just doing nothing for a whole six nights, but in days of meditation and being out in the stars and making contact. And uh, I'm leading it. So it's not like I'm off, as it were. I'm not, you know, I'm, uh, but it's very renewing mm -hmm. to do that because you, you get so much um, inner strength from those higher states of consciousness and the energy from it. So that's what I'm doing. Cause you know, I, I pretty much push myself a hundred, 120 hours a week mm. at this stage with everything I'm working on. But, so that's kind of my lifestyle routine. And I'm very like in the morning, well, my mornings are odd because I go to bed around 4am and get up at noon. That's my normal schedule. Oh, um, I'm very much a night person. But um, my, I don't, breakfast for me is a fruit juice, water, and an, an orange. I always have an orange. That's it. And then I'll have a protein shake. That's it. And then we'll have a lunch and, and dinner. But I'm, I'm very much trying to keep myself uh, in, in good enough shape to do what I'm doing. And I love it. It's great stress management. You know, I, I like, like tonight, I'm going to go to gym and I leg press 900 pounds and crazy stuff. And <laughs> impressive. Yeah, That's for an awesome. old dude. 
I love so, working out. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I just rejoined a gym, which is like, mm-hmm. you know, would have been, been a pedestrian conversation at one point. <laughs> right, and after right. two years of the pandemic, mm-hmm. it's like, you did what? It's amazing <laughs> how excited I got. Mm-hmm. It is wonderful. Yeah. And even with, with, during that, I, I got some things here at the house and, and then would go mountain biking, hiking out here. And, um, you know, it, it's just gonna, my, the, my great love, how I found spirit was through nature. My first great love was the earth and nature. And I found a great peace and also spirituality in the wonder and beauty of everything, not man-made. So growing up a poor boy in the South, in rags, I was so happy with flowers and trees and skinny dipping and streams and running around like a urchin, but it was all about nature and being outdoors. So I get great. Um, for me, it's very renewing to be out in nature. What do you next dare to dream, Dr. Gear? What, mm. what kind of future dreams and goals do you have? Well, my, my great dream is to have enough people doing CE5 contact that it causes this trend phase transition as it's called uh, where a critical mass of people begin to move in the right direction where earth becomes a peaceful global civilization and that happening at the same time disclosure that we're working on by the way I can't talk about what's going on in Washington right now but the biggest advances since I've been doing this in 32 years are going on right now that I'm involved with. And that's a little zinger, just think about that. Um, and, and these, so I still have the dream of, of seeing the world that I've seen in lucid precognitive dreams uh, come about where there's no pollution, there's no poverty. We're moving across the land floating in these devices quietly. There are no freeways. Um, and our civilization can finally move on to focus, focusing on the achievement of enlightenment uh, as a civilization. That's my dream. That's what I'm working on until I get carried out of here feet first. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show today and for the work you do. Thank you. You're an angel. I appreciate you having me. Such a pleasure. And folks, if you're ready to learn more, You can reach out at SeriousDisclosure.com to connect with Dr. Greer and his team, as well as his YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Dr. Stephen Greer 55. And I end today's show with this quote from Dr. Stephen Greer, never be discouraged by this transient time of chaos. Keep your sight fixed on that far horizon, knowing the far horizon is not really that far for it is already here, folded within us. Subscribe to the show. If you're listening on the podcast, go ahead and join the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment, share. And next week on the show, I am featuring Walter Zajac. He's a highly respected psychic medium, NLP practitioner, Reiki master and author. He's given insight to thousands of people over the globe. His life has been filled with verified psychic phenomenon, including a verified shared near-death experience and hundreds of dreams and visions that have come true. Don't just dare to dream anymore for yourself, your state, your country, or the globe. It is time now to go way beyond that and look out to the stars because they truly are our brothers and sisters. Thanks for joining us today.